with one voice, we will sing. Every tribe and every tongue brings a harmony. With one voice, we will bring heaven's beautiful melodies down to this earth. sermon today is about being the salt of the earth. <laughs> In the greatest sermon that was ever preached, Jesus himself <coughs> writes these words. In Matthew 5, 13, he says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the power that it contains. And we pray that it would speak to our hearts today as dividing between bone and marrow. Father, let us know your truths and let us live those truths. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> We don't have to look far to see the world going to hell in a handbasket. And the amazing thing to me is that as Christians, we stand by and we watch this happening, and we go, how in the world can this be taking place? And the truth is, is that we as Christians have, have, have relinquished our responsibility for making a difference in the world. But Jesus Christ himself said, you are the salt of the earth. And if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled by man. And I would say to you today that we, as the church of Jesus Christ in this world, are losing our saltiness. We need to understand what Jesus is saying with this simple passage of Scripture, this simple declaration. And unlike some of the other things that Jesus teaches, he doesn't explain what he means, and so we have to infer what he means from the very thing that he teaches. So the question that we need to ask ourselves is how are we Christians like salt? The first thing that you need to know, the very first thing that you need to understand is that like salt, you are of infinite value. <clears throat> you are of infinite value. Now wait a minute, Pastor. Are you telling me that salt has infinite value? Because I can go to Walmart and I can get a whole box of salt for less than a dollar. What do you mean it has infinite value? Jesus was saying something very significant and you need to hear it. Don't miss it. <clears throat> What we read in that verse was the New International Version, but I want to put up the King James Version because there's something a little different about the King James Version than the New International Version. If you could put that up for me. See in the room up there? King James Version of that, that same verse. You are the salt of the earth. In the King James it says, Ye are the salt of the earth. Ye are the salt <coughs> of the earth. Now, <clears throat> see the problem here is that we, we've got a little grammatical uh, construct taking place and we miss this. 
when, when we use in the modern English the word you, we're not talking about you individually, but we're talking about maybe a, another way to put this is y'all are the salt of the earth. <clears throat> because the word ye or the word you, as it's, as it's translated, means you, all of you. All of you. If you call yourself a Christian, then you are the salt of the earth. <clears throat> Jesus was speaking. Remember, we've got to look at the context. Jesus was speaking to a handful of basically uneducated men. And he described these uneducated working men as the salt of the earth. <clears throat> Whether you believe it or not, Jesus <clears throat> was paying a great compliment to them and by extension to you and to me. You see, unlike today, salt had a lot more value back then than it does today. In fact, today we almost we almost have sworn off salt because it causes high blood pressure and some other things, but it was much more useful back then even than it is today. <clears throat> it was a necessity of life in Jesus' day, and because of that, it was very valuable. Salt was so important that sometimes, sometimes it was used as money. Sometimes salt was used as money. We have, we have historical evidence that Roman soldiers in Jesus' day were at times paid with salt. <clears throat> How'd you like that on your pay voucher? <laughs> in fact, our word salary, the word that we use for salary, comes from the Latin word salarium, which refers to the payment of soldiers with salt. At any time that we use this phrase, he's worth his salt, or her salt, we're paying a high compliment. <clears throat> Today we don't think about it as being valuable because we can get as much of it as we want. I mean, after all, we're talking about the white stuff in the little bottle that sits on the table. But when you're completely dependent on salt to preserve your food, you see, this is before GE and Westinghouse and <coughs> Samsung and all of these companies that make refrigeration units. If you depend upon salt for the preservation of your food, then salt becomes a necessary commodity. And the fact that it was so valuable that it could be used instead of money spoke to how different the people back then had a perspective on salt than we do today. Because we live in a society with an abundance of food and more than just an abundance, a variety of food. We don't understand the monotony of the diet of those people who lived when Jesus was alive. <clears throat> there are places in the world today where they eat the same food three times a day. In parts of Africa, the subsistence food is cornmeal. And in fact, the Swahili word for cornmeal is posha, which means daily ration. Cornmeal given to workers on a plantation is called posha, and it means daily rations. <clears throat> I remember hearing one time a missionary telling of a local dish, and the name of this dish was ugali. <coughs> ugali. That was the name of the dish, ugali. And it was a concoction, a corn mash, and it was appropriately named because that's definitely what it tasted like. Ugali. <laughs> you see, without salt to make it palatable, it would be difficult to continue to swallow the same food, breakfast, lunch, dinner, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and so on. In fact, 
In Job 6.6, 6, the Bible says, can flavorless food be eaten without salt? For this reason alone, we can see that salt is vital and it's very valuable. But the second reason that Christians are like salt is because salt acts as a preservative. <clears throat> salt is a preservative. Remember I said that, that it was used to cure their meat. And the way this was done is when the meat was ready to be preserved, they would take the salt and they would rub the salt into the meat before they stored it. And what the salt did was it slowed down the natural decaying process. And in the same way, we as Christians are given the task of slowing down the decay of the world. I want you to think about that. Christianity has clearly had a positive effect on the world. The greatest impact of Christianity on the world is that, that Christianity attaches a new meaning and a new significance to life, to human life. <clears throat> Prior to Christianity, infanticide was rampant. The abandonment of children was a common practice. Many hospitals in the world today were established through the influence of Christianity. In fact, the Red Cross, the international organization that responds to the needs of people around the world, was started by an evangelical Christian. Almost every one of the first 123 colleges or universities in the United States has Christian origin. They were founded by Christians for Christian purposes. The same could be said of orphanages and adoption agencies and humane treatment of the insane. The list goes on and on and on, the dramatic impact that Christians have had on our world. And Christians continue to have a positive effect on our world. We serve kind of like a moral and a septic, and Christians are designed, the purpose of being salt in the world is to be designed <coughs> to keep the corruption of society at bay by opposing the moral decay that's taking place in the lives of people in this world today. But there's a troubling new trend. <clears throat> I subscribe to an email list from George Barna. George Barna is probably <coughs> the best known Christian uh, statistician. statistician. And his research indicates this, and I want to put it up on the screen. <clears throat> the average Christian in the average church is almost indistinguishable from the rest of society. Let me read that. Back that up. I want to read that again. <clears throat> the average Christian in the average church is almost indistinguishable from the rest of society. Keep going. The fundamental moral and ethical difference that Christ can make in how we live is missing. When our teens who claim to be saved get pregnant and do drugs at the same rate as the general teenage population, when the marriages of Christians end in divorce at the same rate or greater than the rest of society, and when Christians cheat in business or lie, steal, or cheat on their spouses at the same statistical level as those who say they're not Christians, something is horribly wrong. If we as Christians lose that quality of Christ-likeness that makes us unique and that makes us distinct and instead become like the society around us, we no longer have any positive impact in our society. In fact, we actually become a hindrance instead of a preservative. Listen, according to Scripture, when Jesus Christ returns, the church is going to be removed from the world. <coughs> 
And literally, when the Christians are gone, <coughs> all hell is going to break loose. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 7, we read this. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. But the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. Do you know who that he that it's referring to? The one that it's referring to there? That's not Jesus Christ. Who is it? It's you and it's me. We are the ones that are holding back the way of the enemy. And that's why Pastor Vance is so passionate about our young people because young men and women need to understand the enemy wants you. You're marked individuals. The enemy knows your name and he's trying every way he can to dissuade you from being Christ-like in this world and living a life different from those around you. You need to understand this. <clears throat> we are to serve as preservatives to hold back the decay that is taking place in our society. Number three, Christians are like salt because we promote thirst. <laughs> when I was just out of high school, I didn't know what I was going to do in my life. <clears throat> and so I got a job working for a plumbing company. I was a plumber's assistant. <clears throat> I made $2.60 an hour. $2.60 an hour, and this is what I did. And I lived in Tampa, Florida, so I did this in 100 degree weather. You can see very quickly why I decided to do something else. <clears throat> My point in saying this, though, is that one of the things that they had available for us, and I don't see these anymore on work sites, mainly because of the effect of salt on the body, but there used to be everywhere there was a water fountain or a cooler or a jug of water, there was a little dispenser on the side of it that dispensed salt tablets. Did anybody remember seeing those? Okay, you don't see those anymore. <clears throat> but they were salt tablets, and you take one or two of them when you get a drink of water, and the reason for that is that it promoted thirst. And when we're thirsty, what are we going to do? We're going to drink. And so the salt works as a way to promote thirst. You see where I'm going with this? Okay, how are Christians like salt in this area? In the same way, we need to be the ones who promote thirst for Jesus Christ by making him attractive and desirable. In Titus 2.10, the Apostle Paul tells us that they must act in such a way so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. <clears throat> that word attractive is a Greek word that we get the word cosmetics from, and it's used to describe an arrangement of jewels in a manner to set off their full beauty. The idea here is that as Christians, we have the power through the influence of the word and through our lives as Christians to, be, to make the Word of God appealing to the world. Wherever we go as Christians, unbelievers should see the evidence of Jesus Christ in our life shining out in such a beautiful and attractive way that they desire, when they look at us, they say, I don't know what that person has, but I want it. But the problem is, is we started to look like the world. And there's nothing different about us from the rest of the world, and we can hide in plain sight. Christians, we're supposed to promote thirst. Number four, like salt, we can lose our usefulness. The second part of that verse that we read in the beginning says, it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. Now, technically speaking, salt cannot lose its saltiness. Sodium chloride is sodium chloride, <clears throat> and it cannot lose its saltiness. But in Jesus' day, the way that they got salt was done by mining it, and there were a lot of impurities in the salt. And so the salt that they would use 
for preservatives and for flavoring of food and, and, and these kind of things, would, would the saltiness of that, that powder that they had would leach out. And so what would be left would be a tasteless powder. It would be of no value at that point. And so it says, in this verse, it says they would, it would be good for nothing except to be thrown out and trampled by men. And that's what people often did. When it would lose its saltiness, then they would literally throw it in the street. It would be no good. You wouldn't throw it on your garden, though, because there's one thing about it that you need to know. Even though it was no good as a preservative, even though it was no good as a flavoring, even though it was no good any longer to promote thirst, it was still powerful enough that if you threw it on your garden, it would kill the plants. It would retain enough of the saltiness that it would destroy life. Christians can lose their usefulness. Jesus was saying this, the constant flow of the world's value through our lives can essentially wash out our Christian influence. <clears throat> when Mahatma Gandhi was the spiritual leader of India, he was asked by some missionaries <clears throat> this question, what is the greatest hindrance to Christianity in India? And you know what he said? Christians. Christians. You see, because of this one fact, if it loses its salty flavor, it still retains that devastating <coughs> potency to kill and destroy plant life. The same thing applies in the case of the Christian. You see, either our lives are counting for God and for good, or they are making an impact for evil and the enemy. And the way that we live, the things that we say, the attitudes that we entertain, the lifestyle that we lead, we're either continually producing positive results or we're producing negative results. There is no middle ground. There is no middle ground. Whether we're aware of it or not, our lives either count for God or we're working against God. There is no middle ground. Number five, Christians like salt must have contact to have an influence. We've already noted the Christian is to be a preserving force in the world. We're supposed to promote thirst. <clears throat> and yet, salt never does any good when it sits on the shelf and the food is somewhere else. It has to make contact with the food in order for it to become valuable and useful. <clears throat> Christians should not allow God I'm sorry, Christians should allow God to use them successfully in life. When churches become salt warehouses, we have missed out on the lesson that salt must make contact in order to have an effect. We've got to be out in the world. We've got to be, we are the salt of the world. We're the salt of the earth. We have to be out there. But what we've done is we've created these these. these enclaves of Christian communities. And we go in there and we close the doors and we never have contact with the outside world. Now this is the trick, you see, because the outside world is working hard to influence you. But your goal and your purpose as a Christian is to be a positive influence in the world. And so you have to be vigilant. That's why we call the men up front to say, you've got to be standing in the gap every day. This isn't something that you can do today and forget about it. You've got to do it every day, man, because you've got to be standing in the gap for your family. But women, you're not, a, you're not exempt from this requirement either. You also need to be standing for your family. You need to be standing for your children. You need to be engaging the world. If you don't have any non-Christian friends, then you're not being effective. You're, 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 you're sitting in the salt shaker on the shelf. If you don't have any non-Christian friends, you're not doing what God has called you to do. He said to be in the world, but not of the world. In other words, we've got to go out there. We need to run to the very gates of hell, if that's what it takes, to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, to be salt, and to flavor, and to create thirst, and to preserve, and to show the value of being a Christian. <clears throat> Number six. 
I want you to notice what Jesus says and what he does not say. He does not say, you all can be the salt of the earth. He does not say, you all should be the salt of the earth. What he says is, you are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. You and you alone are the salt of the earth. He doesn't say you and some other entity. You're the ones that have been placed into the world, into the ingredients that create this world to make a difference. Just like when you put salt on your food, it changes the taste. When you inject yourselves into the society, then it should change the flavor of that society for God. You and you alone are the salt of the earth. Sure. Now, to be salt, we don't have to be spectacular. To be salt, we don't have to be sensational. To be salt, we don't have to be successful as the world measures success. To be salt, we just need to make a difference where God has placed us. We simply need to make a difference in our little corner of the world. And if we do that, then we'll impact the entire world for Christ. Young people, you need to understand this. That you have been placed in your schools, in your classes, in your places of influence... So that you can be the salt of the earth. So that you can be the representative of Jesus Christ where God has planted you. But what we allow to happen is that we allow the world to influence us instead of the other way around. And it's time for Christians to completely reverse that process and say, I am not going to allow the world to influence me one more I iota. I am not going to allow the world to influence me one step of the way. Instead, I'm going to be the salt of the world. I'm going to be the salt in my class. I'm going to be a salt among my friends. I'm going to be the salt that brings flavor and creates thirst and preserves to those who are around me yes, who are dying and going to hell every day. Yes, yes, yes. We simply need to make a difference where God has placed us. And if we do that, and we'll flavor the entire recipe. And the world will know that something different has taken place. And that difference is Jesus Christ. You, all of you, are the salt of the earth. Let's go out and stir up some stuff. Glory to God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word today. It is a powerful word, and yet so simple a message. You have placed us in this world to make a difference. You have placed us where we are with our personality and, and, and our height and our, and our weight and our hair color and our friends and our, all of these things that make us who we are, Father, in order that we might make a difference to those around us. Father, if we walk into the room and nobody notices us, then we're not doing our job. We need to make a difference wherever we go. We need to be the one that's bringing hope where there is no hope. Father, we need to be the ones that are bringing peace where there is no peace. We need to be bringing joy where there is no joy. We need to be bringing truth where nothing but lies exist. Help us, Father, to be the salt of the world wherever we go and whatever we do, Father. Let us be an influence in a positive way for the kingdom of God. That's our prayer today, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to stand in a minute. Renee's going to come to the piano. We're not going to sing. We're not going to have the praise team come. We're simply going to offer an invitation to you. <clears throat> I've already had the men up here, but maybe it isn't just the men. Maybe it's, it's someone else in the, in the congregation as well, where you are saying to yourself, you know, I haven't been what God has, has created me to be. I haven't been that person of influence 
in my workplace or in my school or in my home or in my neighborhood or amongst my family members. I haven't been what God created me to do and placed me in this world to do. And today that's coming with one voice.